bit weird to do webinars because we can only see each other on the panel. We can't see all of you guys um, who are attending, but thanks for joining. A great turnout. Um, welcome to the second of the Climate Caucus Councillor webinar series. My name is Chiang Ho. I'm with WCS Engagement and Planning, and I recognize lots of your names and those of you who joined the first webinar will have seen me, so it's me again moderating this. Um, I first want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded shared territories of the Squamish and Liwat nations, and I'd like to thank them for sharing their land with us. Today's webinar is focused on municipal parking, a topic that we all love to talk about. With us today to share their experiences are Donald Shoup, Andrew Knack, and Courtney Cobbs. I'm going to introduce them all in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, if you've been on these webinars, you know the format, but just quickly, the format is a Q&A style session where I'll be posing questions to each of our panelists and they'll, re re they'll respond with their personal experiences and thoughts and insights. You'll notice that the chat function is, dis is disabled for this webinar, but I encourage you to start submitting questions anytime through the Q&A function. My lovely assistant and the amazing person who's been organizing these webinars, Alex Lidstone, who's hiding right now. Can you show your face, Alex? There she is, you all know her. Um, Alex will be monitoring the questions and we will try to get to the, as many questions as we can at the end. If not, we will respond and email them back out to you anyway. Also, the recording of this webinar will be available afterwards. Um, also, Alex has a few words to say at the end of the webinar, so stay tuned for that. But before we get started, we're going to conduct a quick poll, and then I'll introduce our panelists and we'll jump into the questions. So here's our poll. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> Can't vote. Can't vote. Okay, technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. Um, I think just the um, panelists can't vote. So sorry, okay. panelists, but okay, uh, people are voting. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, there, are, uh, there are two other questions. Great. Okay, and I'm just going to go into the third one. Great. those are the results okay interesting thank you alex thanks for for participating in the poll so um they were flashed very quickly but it looks like about half of the the municipalities or the representatives on the on the call the um, the participants about half don't have a parking management strategy a bunch do and of those of you who do they're being it's being implemented so that's good um, the second question was about um, do you implement paid parking? It looks like quite a large number of you do, and um, or sorry, a large number of you don't. And for those of you who do, they're mostly it's mostly implemented in the downtown core. I don't think many, if any, said that you implement paid parking throughout the municipality. So interesting. And then mixed um, thinking about whether you think pay parking is a strategy, obviously one of many, to help with climate action. So let's talk more about that um, in this session today. So I'm going to introduce our esteemed panel. First, we have Donald Shoup. Donald Shoup is a distinguished research professor 
look, he looks very distinguished, in the Department of Urban Planning at the University of California, Los Angeles. His research has focused on transportation, public finance, and land economics, with emphasis on how parking policies affect cities, the economy, and the environment. In his landmark 2005 book, The High Cost of Free Parking, that I'm sure we've all got by our bedside, Shoup recommended that cities should, one, charge fair market prices for on-street parking, two, spend the revenue to improve parking services in the metered neighborhoods, and three, remove off-street parking requirements. In his 2018 book, Parking and the City, Shoup and his co-authors examined the result, results where cities have adopted these practices. The successful outcomes show this trio of reforms may be the simplest, cheapest, and fastest way to improve city life, protect the environment, and promote social justice. Thanks for joining us, Donald. Andrew Knack. Andrew was born in Edmonton and has lived in Ward 1 since 2001. He received his Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Alberta in 2006 and managed a retail business based in the ward until being elected. Andrew currently serves as the council representative. So if, if this isn't clear, he's on Edmonton City Council. So he's currently serving as the council representative on the Accessibility Advisory Committee, City of Edmonton Youth Council, and Edmonton Transit System Advisory Board. He is responsible for four council in initiatives, Gen Seniors, Public Engagement and Transportation Innovation. Um, Andrew is currently involved right, right smack in the middle of budget discussions. So um, he's just joining us on his lunch break. So thanks, Andrew, for joining us. And this will be stimulating. You'll be going back to your budget discussions all excited. Courtney. Courtney Cobbs lives in Chicago, Illinois. She is the assistant editor for Streets Blog Chicago, a blog informing Chicago residents of sustainability, transportation news, and issues. She's a biking and transit visionary who believes in the transformative power of all ages and abilities, cycling infrastructure, and affordable, frequent, and quality mass transit. You can read her musings on these topics on Twitter at Courtney Cycle, Cycle Z. Cycles, is, cycles. Um, we can pass that. that to <laughs> Thanks for making the time, all of you, for sharing your expertise. Okay, we all know that municipal parking is one of the most fun issues that local government e elected officials and staff have to deal with. Courtney gets really excited. So this is <laughs> talking about parking. Um, and it's generally, I'd say, one of the most effective platforms for getting reelected, right? <laughs> Talk about paid parking, you're gonna get elected. But when we talk about municipal parking, it's about a comprehensive strategy about all municipally related parking issues. It's about on-street parking, parking, regulating parking uh, requirements during development, residential and commercial parking, and if, if paid parking, how to charge it, what's the price, what's the timing, how much, etc. So it's a whole wide gamut of issues. So we'll start off by, um, I'm going to ask Donald Shoop some questions. Donald, may I call you Shoop Dog? Well, Snoop Dog and I were both born in Long Beach, so that has to count for something. For sure. <laughs> okay, so Shoop Dog, you're a bit of a guru on parking pricing, and you've done lots of research on parking reform, parking pricing, parking strategies, including some humorous titles such as Making Parking Meters Popular and For Whom the po for whom the road tolls. Can you give us a very condensed Coles Notes version of your key considerations that local governments should keep in mind as they begin to regulate parking or when they're developing a municipal parking strategy, especially as we're trying to deal with our climate emergency? So just a Coles Note. Well, I don't think you want somebody from Los Angeles telling you how to manage transportation in Canada, uh, because we've made such a mess of things, not only in Los Angeles, but throughout the country. Uh, but we've done so many things wrong that we've had to find solutions for the problems that we've created. And I think some of these solutions will, they're working well in the United States and around the world. And, um, and I think they should work for Canada. Um, you, you already mentioned in a very brief uh, way you know, what my main recommendations are. As I said, the first one is, is to charge the right prices for curb parking. Um, 
and by right prices, I mean the, the, the lowest prices the city can charge, so there are one or two open spaces on every block, which is what the driver wants to see. They want to see an open space waiting for them. Um, so the spaces will be well used, they'll be mostly occupied by people who are you know, shopping in stores or going to appointments or uh, whatever the reason for being there is, most of the spaces will be readily available as well. The, so if you, if you have them both well used and readily available, what more do you expect from Curb Parker? Um, but most cities don't um, uh, achieve either of these, these, uh, these uh, goals most of the time. Often the spaces are half empty, often they're all full. Uh, so how do you get to that sweet spot of, of one or two open spaces on every block? So some cities have, have, have begun doing this. The technology is now available, much of it made in Canada, um, to uh, measure the occupancy of the spaces and to adjust prices uh, without touching the meters, do it remotely, keeping track of, of how the uh, how the occupancy responds to the, the prices. Uh, San Francisco was the first city that really tried this in a big way. Um, they aim for one or two open spaces on every block and they have different prices at different times of day. It's lower in the morning, it turns out. Um, they had to lower almost all prices in the morning. They, because if you have the same price all day long, it's going to be too high at some times and too low at others. So they adjusted prices and starting from a price of two or three dollars an hour, uh, most morning prices went down to 25 cents an hour. Um, and then the afternoon and the, uh, the midday, the, the, they, they went up. But on average, the prices declined by 4%, which means, uh, you know, essentially they were unchanged. They were, they were uh, readjusted lower in the morning and higher in the afternoon. And they, they, they don't change prices every day. Uh, they have different prices on different blocks and at different hours. Uh, but they look at the experience and they readjust these prices every two or three months. Uh, uh, oh, that's great. And it, so you've, you reminded us that parking management isn't to make sure that there's lots of parking available and empty spots all the time. It's a balance of making sure there's enough, um, yet not too much. And parking pricing is a good one of the good strategies or tools. What are other ways of, of like, making sure that you've got the right number? What's it, isn't, it isn't just one strategy, it's the only strategy. There's no other way to do it. Um, the pricing and, is the only strategy? Yeah, other cities that have fallen along, Seattle and Los Angeles and Boston and Washington and some cities overseas. So to, to make that uh, politically popular, uh, I recommend that the money should be spent on added public services on the metered streets. Uh, so fixing your sidewalks, um, uh, removing graffiti, uh, planting street trees. Um, say uh, Boulder, Colorado uses the meter money to give free transit passes to everybody who works in the metered area. Uh, so people will see, well, these are the benefits. If we have meters, we get free transit passes. If we don't have meters, we don't get free transit passes. Some cities give free Wi-Fi to everybody. And I think if around the world, the parking meters become identified with the free Wi-Fi on the block, that they will become important, especially in low-income countries. Um, uh, so these parking benefit districts are the, the, the way to make things to make them popular, say with Redwood City in, in Northern California just, uh, considered this, um, the, it was called Deadwood City before they, they, they put in the parking meters and changed things. Uh, but when, the, when all the merchants of the property owners, the residents learned that the meters would pay for added public service on the, on the, on the meter blocks, the city council voted for it unanimously. It was popular when you consider both the source of the revenue and the use of the revenue. It's much more easy to understand the benefits of meters if the meter money stays on the on the metered block. So 
So John, those are, in so Miami. Those are great we, points. And I'd like us to just pause on that because we're gonna talk about benefits and, and how to make sure we get public support in a little bit. But I wanna turn it over to Andrew and Courtney to ask from, you, you two have very different um, perspectives and, and backgrounds, council, uh, elected official and, and other committee work. And Courtney, you're really an activist and a, and a writer and very engaged in the community. From your individual experiences, um, can you add to what Donald has said? For example, how can we make sure we address, we do address equity issues, so we make sure we don't impact lower income individuals or people who have accessibility needs? Um, and, and then maybe touch on how important is it to tie parking management to broader community goals and objectives? Uh, Courtney, I'll turn to you first. Yeah, I think the community, I think that community engagement is very important. And I think oftentimes it can be seen as something that you just check off the list. We engage the community, but I think it needs to be as robust as possible in order to ensure that you have that public support. So the more time and effort you put into public and community engagement, I think the better you can sell something. And to tie in to Donald's points about the benefits, I think going to the community and saying, hey, we are interested in you know, trying this new strategy. If we try it, what kind of benefits are important to you? And in my research and looking at other cities, the cities that are having the best outcomes when it comes to equitable transit oriented development when it comes to equitable development in general affordable housing those sorts of things they are cities that are really putting their money where their mouth is and really investing in that community engagement component so having people who are lower income at the table having um racial minorities at the table and leading the discussions and saying hey these are the things that are important to us and then it's up to the planner or the city council member or whoever to tie in the community's values to the city's values and how can we weave those two together so that we're sort of speaking the same language or at the very least you understand why it is that we want to do this and you're on board would you say Chicago has done a good job of community engagement in addressing equity and accessibility issues? I, I feel like we're in the very beginning stages of recognizing how important that it is. Unfortunately, um, the city has done a lot of community engagement, but they've fallen short of actually implementing those things. So people are very familiar with filling out a survey, going to a meeting and giving their input. And then it's five or six years later, a decade later, and there's been absolutely no movement. But something that does have me hopeful is our equitable transit oriented development plan, which recently came out in the past few weeks. And I feel like we are on the right track to actually implementing the things that people are saying are important to them and the city is listening and saying okay based on your feedback this is how we're going to proceed and just one final question your transit oriented development plan must therefore include some parking strategies as part of it it did and it was interesting for me to read it but it wasn't surprising so with the working groups that they created parking was not a very high priority for people in the working groups. And these were people that come from the city of Chicago, they're residents, they're different advocacy groups that represent different parts of the city. But there was still some really good uh, feedback for the plan and lots of people want to see dynamic uses. So there's a surface parking lot in your neighborhood and it's like, why can't people from the neighborhood use that at night? Cause it just sits empty. Like why isn't that something that we can do? So I, it's not a high priority for a lot of people, but I think when you have those conversations, people are willing to engage and you probably have more in common than you think. I love that idea of using 
empty parking lots for other community purposes. So, so maybe we can talk about that a bit later, but I'll turn, turn it over to Andrew. What's going on in Edmonton? Um, do you have extra big parking lots for all the trucks? Yeah, oh gosh, we have we have more parking than what we what we know what to do with. Uh, and, and so thanks for having me. And, and yeah, I think the, the challenge in Edmonton is we we are one of the most spread out cities, and in fact, in all of North America. And uh, that created a situation where we have these giant parking lots for all of our big box stores that are almost never filled. And uh, and yet every time we've talked about parking so when there's a rezoning application for that new development even if somebody wants to build change out from a single family home to a duplex parking oh goodness that is the world the world will end if we allow that because now i'm going to have a tougher time parking on my street even though every almost every home has a garage that can fit at least two cars with a parking pad that can fit another two, but that's where we store our $1,000 worth of junk, not our $20,000 vehicle. We put that on the street, out in the elements. That's the right place to put it. Um, so- I think a lot of people can relate. A lot of our communities can relate to that. <laughs> so so there's this, there was always this fear around any decision we were going to make because we're such a car-centric city. And so as we begin our shift into a different direction, uh, that that anything we did would would create very big challenges and people would be fear, fearful of what that looks like. So the city of Edmonton recently adopted what we're calling our open option parking, which essentially means we're leaving it up to the market now. We have no parking requirements uh, at all, anywhere. Uh, and and we've done that because it's, it's a, actually a really good way to, I think, move us in the right direction because I know there are cities that actually do parking uh, maximums. You can't do any more than that. And, and that might be a great end goal and it might be easier to accomplish in certain cities, but in a car dominated city, it was a lot easier to use that as our entryway into this conversation because you could actually make arguments to wherever somebody was on the political spectrum. Because if you've got somebody who's a bit more progressive and focused on good urban planning and development, well, it's easy to convince them why we wanna not have uh, such high parking regulations because it doesn't allow those walkable, complete communities. And uh, in fact, going to the equity question, it's actually preventative for affordable housing. So we had affordable housing developments that some of them went through, but I remember one presentation from a group called Right at Home Housing where she showed us the empty parquet that they have underneath their building because nobody that lives in that development can afford a car. And yet we required them to spend essentially thirty to sixty thousand dollars per spot to build an underground parquet for development that would never use cars. So from an equity point of view, it's very easy to say that is not valuable. If, if people aren't going to be using it, don't put that cost onto the housing. We could have built more units of affordable housing uh, with that. And, and then on the other side of the spectrum, it was actually really easy to argue for those that might have normally, normally been fearful, but then to say, well, what about the free market? And, and you say that because if you're building a big box grocery store in the suburbs of Edmonton, there is no way that the person building that or the company building that is going to build it without enough parking. And in fact, the companies that finance those developments are not going to finance a development with zero parking outside our you know, ring road that we have in the city of Edmonton because we know that we built those communities that way. But this does allow a little more flexibility because when most of them have this big anchor tenant that does require often a grocery store, but then there's a lot of smaller businesses that also require parking, or at least used to require parking on the same big box giant developments. And now we allow those smaller businesses to open up without needing to tie that to any type of requirement, except for accessible parking, just to be very clear, because that is still a requirement no matter where you go. So I found this has been really easy. When we brought this forward, you know, we had a handful of people who contacted me back to this engagement piece, but the city actually think did a really good job of engaging different groups and organizations. Uh, and in fact, we had the business community out in full force when that proposal came before city council championing this. So council didn't have to champ champion this. We had the business community saying, let us do this. We know how to do it. We're going to do it right. 
and and it developed so limited uh, in terms of we had very limited opposition and really after we passed it outside of maybe less than 10 emails the week after we did it I have since to hear any concerns because as we expected the world didn't end the next day we passed this we didn't see everyone shut down their parking lots because they could um, that's that was a good way I think for us to, to get a get behind us as a city that's great to know the world didn't end when you par passed a parking bylaw. So that's amazing. And I think the way you framed it as open market, because it satisfies so many people's concerns around, well, the, the market will dictate or, or whatever. So have has that shifted, has that reduced a lot of parking um, development or parking development in new developments? So we're still early days because we really just passed it this year, but but we know that there are developments that were waiting for this because they wanted to proceed with that opportunity. Um, and actually, I expect the bigger change is going to come from some of the smaller scaled redevelopments. So when somebody's rebuilding a home in a mature neighborhood, they might build a single car garage instead of a two car garage, which allows them to do a garden suite at the back that's ground level for accessible housing. Uh, there's there's so many different ways to look at it, but we know that there were companies ready to go. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, as much as I'd love to see it change in our suburban neighborhoods, this isn't going to change overnight because we built those communities in a very poor way that sort of forced everyone to have a car. So there will be a natural transition over time, but it's not going to be an overnight flip. And I think that the people are already understanding that now about, you know, six or seven months into this, that um, there isn't going to be an overnight change in those neighborhoods because there actually really can't be. The market wouldn't wouldn't make it work in that way yet. Yeah. And even though all three of you are from large cities, we can totally see how some of these strategies are applicable to smaller communities. And we'll talk a bit about that as well. Okay, my next question is, all right, let's not beat around bush. We need to encourage alternatives to driving, especially single occupant vehicles, given our climate crisis and, and other issues. Um, the, the climate big moves is something that many municipalities in BC are adopting and one of the big moves is around shifting or moving beyond the car. How can we use parking management to support this big move, to, to just support alternatives, getting people out of, of cars, sh shifting? Um, so how can we use parking management and what are some specific tools that you've seen or used or recommend? We'll go Donald, then Courtney, then Andrew, please. Well, I think we should realize that all our policies now, uh, parking policies do encourage driving. Uh, the, 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 we have to admit that uh, free curb parking, uh, uh, high off street parking requirements, are guaranteed to encourage driving. In fact, it punishes people who don't have a car. You know, a city that is designed for cars is very unfriendly for somebody who can't afford a car. And the only way you can take advantage of all these subsidies is to buy a car. And in the United States, you often have to, to finance it. You have to borrow the money. You, you have to finance it but with a title loan at a very high interest rate. So I think we should realize that our current policies are very much pro-car. Okay, thank you for that sobering and I guess realistic uh, thought. Courtney, what do you think? Well, kind of going back to what Donald shared earlier, like the benefits, I came across something that they do in Portland. I don't believe that it's citywide, but tying the revenue that they make from the parking to strategies to reduce driving. So for example, revenue from the parking could go towards um, improving a bike lane, it could go towards transit passes in these cases. So make, helping make the connection very clear to people that if we continue to provide you with a free spot, that is a fossil fuel subsidy. I have made that very clear to my council member that the fact that people can park their $30,000 luxury SUV feet away from the lakefront, I live right on Lake Michigan. I'm like, that is a direct conflict between our climate goals. You can't say we care about the environment, but fiercely defend someone being able to park 
their car for free on the streets that we all pay for and that we all use. Um, and here in Chicago, we have the challenge of a hundred year parking meter deal that a former mayor made. So signed away lots of street space to a parking meter company. And we can directly see how these parking spaces get in the way, literally, of a bus only lane, a protected bike lane. And so people are trying to find ways to get around that parking meter deal so that we can make it easier for people to not drive. But we're also overlooking the low hanging fruit of residential parking and how can we um, get people to pay the true cost of driving and see the connection between their driving and the climate. So working on it, not solved yet. Not solved yet. And I think it's, I would personally love to see us have a more aggressive parking policy in neighborhoods that in the area that I live in because it is so transit rich and a lot of people are just driving because they can versus in other parts of the city where people have no other choice but to drive. If the nearest grocery store is five or six miles away, it makes sense. Where I live, I can walk out of my door and within a mile, I, I have three or four grocery stores that I can choose from. So making sure that um, you're doing it um, with the context in mind and not every parking policy should be cookie cutter because every neighborhood is different. Great. Thanks for that, Courtney. And for you on the, on the webinar participants, if you have a good idea that your municipality is ha, has implemented, it would be really great to share it among this group as well. So if you have, if you if you can send a quick link via the Q and A to a strategy or bylaw or whatever, um, do that because we'll share all of this back out with the participants. And I just want to mention that in Whistler. Um, the municipality implemented pay parking a number of years ago and parking revenues are dedicated, to, a, a, a good portion of the parking revenues are dedicated to transit. So all high school students have free transit and also summer weekends are free for everyone on transit. So that's a really great initiative that I just wanted to tout a little bit. Um, Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. So, and and I very much agree with what I've just heard that the challenge we run into in a spot like Evanston, and this does touch a little bit on what Courtney was saying, is is not having that one size fits all parking management approach because, again, we have some very dense urban core neighborhoods in our downtown and and sort of in our south side of the river beside our university, and and so we have sort of two core areas that are really dense that are far. Uh, you know, far lower uh, percentages of people driving. But then as you get outside of that, that inner core, it's a very different world. And, and so while we struggle with the idea of something like putting paid parking in our mature neighborhoods that were built in the 1950s, or even our suburban communities that are being built outside this inner ring road that we have, or this uh, outer ring road that we have, because again, the, uh, the alternatives don't really exist in our city as well as they need to yet. Our transit system is, you know, I'll, I'll say it's lacking at this point. Uh, I, I used it my entire first term on count or first year on council in 2013. And, you know, even as somebody that lives in a more central area that's not quite in the downtown core, but, but you know, close enough. Uh, you know, it takes me 40 minutes to, from where I live to get downtown to City Hall on the bus. Uh, it takes me 28 minutes to ride my bike. Um, so what am I choosing, right? And if you're in a car, you're there outside of rush hour, you're there in 15 minutes at the, at the longest. So if we don't have good alternatives in place, particularly as you get further outside to the outer edges of our city, hard to put in any type of parking management program. With that said, we have, and uh, Donald's talking about this earlier, which is that we've got this, um, the technology now through our electronic system, our ePARC system that allows us to create more targeted solutions in each neighborhood because what works around one of our uh, main streets where you might wanna have just two hour parking uh, limits during the day 
And then at night, you might want to allow the residents to be able to park on their street without a cost to them, because really, it's not a constraint outside of that time. It's a constraint during the day when those businesses are open. So we're trying to look at those more targeted improvements, while at the same time, we're, we're just about to, in, in the next four months, uh, do a new transit system. Essentially, we, we revamped our entire transit system, like many cities are doing, that are focusing on greater frequencies to really encourage people to do that. And then once we start doing that, I think we'll have the ability and, and if you will, the social license to start looking at other parking management solutions. But it, it's hard to justify that until we have it, because if you are that person who uh, that did you know, borrow money to get a car and that's their only way to get halfway across our city right now. That's a 30 minute car ride, but it would be like a three hour bus ride. It's not equitable to charge them money when they're already were forced to buy a car in the first place. So we're, we're walking that line. And thankfully I think the city's going to be making progress with a pretty major uh, transformation of our transit system. Thank you for that. And those are really good points about more targeted uh, solutions and not not a cookie cutter approach one size doesn't fit all type thing a Andrew I'm going to continue with you um, mm -hmm. because you started talking about it in, in your suburban neighborhoods but I think um, well I know that many of our climate caucus members we come from all over the country and many members are from smaller or more rural municipalities that may not have great public transit or any transit at all or other alternatives to driving a car do you have any suggestions for these communities for managing parking and parking requirements? And what are some first steps to start implementing? Um, and you started touching on that, but if you could just elaborate a bit and then, so we'll go um, Andrew, then back to Courtney and Donald. Sure, so a few things because, and you know, the ward I happen to represent includes some of the, the older, oldest mature neighborhoods in the city, but it also includes some of the newest ones. I go all the way up to the very Western edge of our city. Uh, so communities that are one or two years old. So it's interesting because I get that full experience of neighborhoods and everything in between. And and so I would likely uh, assume in a lot of cases, folks that come from smaller municipalities um, might be more designed like our suburban neighborhoods uh, in a lot of cases. At least that's been my experience in going to a lot of the, the smaller locations throughout Alberta. And I think there's a couple of things that can be done because it might not be cost effective to introduce transit as a municipality. So, so folks aren't able to do that. And I know while it's not a perfect solution in everyone's world, uh, we are starting to see uh, opportunities that cities are contracting out a transit service, an on-demand transit service that is starting to work really well in providing, it's not, it's not full-scale transit, but it's a really positive step in the right direction. And then gives you, again, I think some of that leverage to be able to start looking at targeted solutions. So I think it was uh, just outside the city of Calgary in Cochrane, Alberta, that they worked with Pacific West Transportation. And they're providing an on-demand service for their residents. They didn't have transit at all. Within the first, I think it was two or three months, they got up to 1,000 users per day. Um, so a, a thousand rides per day, I think it is. And, and it's a lower cost solution because you've got a company that's offering that uh, and providing that. We're actually gonna be using them in, uh, them in our suburban communities starting in April as well to reach out to those spots that it didn't already. So once we do that. Battery. I think my microphone died on me. I think I'm back. Uh, can you hear me now? Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I think once we have that, the next piece we can do is have those conversations with those communities and really help them work through what they want their community to be. Because when I'm knocking on those doors in those neighborhoods, they actually want the same thing that I want in my mature neighborhood, where I actually am within a 15 minute walk of every service I need. There was a good Globe and Mail story about that where they broke down all the major Canadian cities and how what percentage of the population is within those 15 minute neighborhoods. And when you go to those suburban communities, they want that too. That's absolutely what they ask for. And so you then, then that introduces an opportunity to say, well, in order to do that, we have to be willing to think differently about how you're going to access those services and the size of those developments. And, and people are usually open to that discussion, recognizing that if I truly had something within a 15 minute walk, 
I would be willing to leave my car at home, but I can't right now because it's nothing, nothing's nearby. So I think you, you have to have a couple of steps to this process to bring those communities along, particularly those of you that might be coming from a smaller jurisdiction without transit. Look at those options as a way to, to start bringing people along with this conversation. Great, thank you, Andrew. And from, from what, you, what you said, it's very obvious that you can't really talk about parking without a broader transportation strategy. Um, Courtney, in, in your experience, um, what do you think about for smaller and rural communities that do not have alternatives to driving? What would you suggest? I think looking at what is available within the 15, maybe even 30 minute radius, um, I'm looking at it from the perspective of someone who bikes for most of their transportation. So for me, a lot of my um, scariest moments on a bike are on major roads. And so it's not necessarily that the city needs to build bike lanes everywhere, but what are the pinch points? What are the major stressor, stressful areas for people who are on a bike? So people might be willing to leave the car at home, but they have no way of safely accessing these places on a bike. So really looking at those super stressful areas and addressing them, as opposed to thinking that you need a whole citywide network. That would be great and lovely, but perhaps there's a way for people to take a residential road for the majority of the way. And then there's, a short segment where the city can step in the county. I'm not sure how it works in Canada, but that's how it works um, here in the United States. So looking at what different municipality controls what and how can we um, work together to address this issue, which ties to a larger goal of like reducing emissions. And once you do that, like Andrew said, you're able to address parking, but these other things have to be implemented first. That's great. Thank you. Um, it, in Canada, it is local governments that have the jurisdiction for, um, for parking. Um, Donald, just to build on what Andrew and Courtney said, is it, is it impossible to do anything around parking before there are other, or before there are alternatives or a broader transportation strategy to, to look at the whole picture first? Or are there small things that can be done in communities to address parking, maybe as a carrot or a stick, in support of the broader transportation um, strategies. Yeah, so I think so. And one of, I'm sorry that my computer keeps cutting out. I hope I can <laughs> finish saying what I intend to say. But I'll get back to what you said about Whistler and using the meter money to subsidize public transit. Um, well, I don't think that's a, the politically the best thing to do. I think the, the, the policy of using the money to give free transit passes to everybody in the metered neighborhood is a better thing. You know, I don't think many people believe that if, we, if you put in meters in my neighborhood, the city will give the money to the transit system and that will make life better for me. Um, I think it's much more better to subsidize public transit through a demand side subsidy. We subsidize the demand for, for transit, not subsidize the transit system itself. The money still goes to the transit system. Mm -hmm. But they, what, what's the problem with transit in the United States is the lack of riders, not the lack of public transit. We have a lot of public transit at very high cost. Uh, but the average ridership is about 25% of the, of the bus capacity. That 75% of the seats on average are vacant. And you're not going to solve that by giving more money to the transit system. You're going to give, solve that politically as well by giving the money to the riders. So they can see that I will benefit if my neighborhood has meters. Nobody's going to get many votes by saying, well, put in meters and give the money to the Whistler transit system or any other city's transit system. And you could also target the, 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 the transit passes. Uh, say what some cities do is to, for, for apartment buildings, instead of requiring you to provide parking, they require the developer to provide a free transit pass for every resident. They're called you know, apartment house transit. 
passes that they, they don't cost that much because most residents don't ride transit. Uh, and universities uh, are very good at this. The many universities give free transit to all their students and faculty and staff. And it doesn't cost that much because most of them don't ride transit. But it's free to everybody. So I think if we have to change, if you look at simple things to do, is to change the prices that we charge. The prices are all wrong. The prices are the signals on how to drive. And for almost every city, the prices tell you drive. Is <laughs> That's very interesting. And I'd love to get your, um your advice on the Whistler thing, but I don't want to suck. I don't want to just uh, sidetrack the whole conversation, but um, just back to the smaller communities very quickly. Um, so lots of communities that don't have transit, is it important to start implementing any parking um, strategies and what would be the first thing to target? So maybe not, maybe not paid parking on street, but maybe just reducing the, maybe implementing a market, what was it called? On market demand, on market um, way to- we, we call it our open option parking, but yeah, you can call it sort of on demand or, or market demand, yeah. Open market option. Is that the, the best thing to, for smaller communities to do if they don't have alternatives right at hand? I, I would say so, because again, I think that's a quick win that, that again, no matter where you are on that political spectrum, you can find someone and a way to bring this up that, that gets them excited about it. So even if you are in a completely car centric neighborhood or, or, or community, frankly, like Edmonton, I mean, let's you know, again, we only have 25% of a population that doesn't, that uses a mode other than their vehicle. And only about 13% of that is, is transit. And yet we have shown that we can bring that forward even without a robust transit system yet because it's simple and, and you and you talk about it like I say you, you bring it up to say let businesses decide how they want to be successful a step and and even more so now you have leverage because businesses are struggling we think about how COVID is impacting the world now and you can then say we want to reduce barriers you want to reduce call it red tape i don't care what you use it but you can find and and appeal to that demographic to say this is actually going to help businesses thrive in a way that wouldn't have been possible before and don't wait for any of those other parts so i mean i was sort of arguing that a little bit earlier but i'll also go and say that we've made this change in a city of, of almost a million people uh, and we're the first large scale city to do that. And there was so little pushback in the, in the end of it. And because it empowers businesses and it lets us also achieve those more, uh, those more broad objectives. So I think that's a quick win that any city can implement and not really be fearful of pushback from, from their residents. Uh, for those of you coming from a political background, that I, I can say that this is not going to be an election issue during our October 2021 election. This will not come up at all because I think people just say, oh, this makes sense, let's go. Those are great words, thank you, Andrew. And this is the last question because I wanna turn over to some questions that are popping up. So just, I'd like each of you to provide one, the best example you've seen um, in terms of how the your municipality or, or, or local government has addressed or has, what are some tips and tricks or how have you best addressed potential political pushback from residents and businesses for changing parking requirements or instituting pay parking? Um, let's start with Courtney and then back to Andrew and then Donald. So want just one, please, you're the best. So it's a mix of parking and a mix of biking infrastructure. But um, recently the Department of Transportation was very, very intentional about having conversations with business owners along a corridor and um, listen very intently to what their needs were and change some of the parking around. Um, in order to accommodate this new protected bike lane that the city created. So I think, again, just going back to that community engagement piece and um, showing people that they really don't have much to be afraid of, if anything. And I think statistics are very important. Like 
we did a study on this day and this is how many of your customers actually arrived by bus, by bike, by walking, by getting here today. And I think those are really powerful because a lot of business owners overestimate how many of their customers drive. I think they just assume. Yep. Yep. Good point. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, quickly, I, I would say so, and we did do a parking management study to help uh, inform this, the policy that we brought forward. Um, but I, I'll say while that was valuable because we did, we were able to showcase that uh, Edmonton's utilization of parking is only 40 to 50 percent. The most notable piece, and I'm going to go to Courtney's part around engagement, and, and, I'll, and I'll challenge particularly the smaller communities, go let your chambers champion this. Go to the chamber your local chambers say, we're thinking of doing this, and they're gonna be the ones at your council meeting saying, well, of course, let us do this. And that's your winning strategy because then it's not council pushing some progressive leftist, you know, anti-car social engineering agenda. It is your business community. Even if you're in a very progressive city, parking somehow excites people across the spectrum at times. So. Let your business community do that. Talk to your progressive urban folks as well about the benefits and, and let them champion it for you because then you don't have to do the work and it's so much easier to get public buy-in. Awesome, great advice. And Donald. Um, well, one solution that I, I think should be done everywhere is that uh, dealing with employer paid parking. It's a very common thing that if you go to work, your employer pays for your parking. Who would, and I learned very quickly, you can't say that, let's get rid of that. Let's start charging for parking. But what California did, Washington, D.C. just began doing, is to require employers who offer free parking to drivers have to offer the employees the option to take the uh, cash value of the subsidy. And it's only for parking spaces that they rent from a third party. So, so the employer breaks even when somebody uh, takes cash rather than a parking space. And in Washington, D.C., they, they uh, just passed it this year, and they emphasized the fairness of it. It's called the Transportation Equity uh, Act. And that one of the reasons for it is that for every black transit riders, there are seven uh, solo drivers. But for every white uh, uh, transit riders, there are 17 solo drivers. So if you give free parking to everybody, it discriminates against everybody who doesn't drive, and many of those are minorities. So I think when you point out the, the, the just genuine unfairness, and then the racial discrimination on top of that, the employer paid parking looks like a very discriminatory policy. And of course, it's, it mitigates against any 15 minute pol neighborhood policy or any climate change policy. Uh, the, a number of studies have shown that employer paid parking increases the number of cars driven to work by about 35%. So if you have this very simple, it's another price change from saying, well, you would have free parking or nothing. And saying, that, well, no, that's not fair. You have to be able to say that I'd rather have a transit pass or I'd rather have the cash. And some people take the cash and rent an apartment within walking distance of where they work or within bicycling distance of where they work or with a good transit connection. So I think employer paid parking is something that just seems like a beneficial, you know, kind policy, but it's, uh, it's unfair and it's racially discriminating. It's called parking cash out. I should be able to take the cash if I don't take the parking. Yeah, that's great. And that's I know there's lots of talk about that in Canada, so um, thank you for that reminder. It's interesting that um, in all the questions, nobody really stuck to just talking about parking, which just shows that you can't just deal with parking without dealing with other community issues, including a broader transportation strategy and access to alternatives and community engagement. So that was great to hear from all of you. We have a bunch of questions and uh, panelists, if you're able to answer some of these online, um, please just respond to them because we won't be able to get through all of them right now. I'll just uh, pick a few to address. Um, one question was, has any other city or any city included a climate action levy on the parking prices or rates? Does, and do any of you know of any? 
Not yet, but sounds like a good idea. Whoever got suggested, maybe you can try um, implementing, implementing it in your community and let us know how it goes. Good luck. Um, and it seems that variable pricing for parking would also have effects and benefits on traffic and possibly even business staffing. Have the extended effects of variable parking pricing been studied? Maybe Don, Donald? Yes, yeah, San Francisco tried this out in a pilot program that had 7,000 meters that they began charging these demand-based prices and they had other neighborhoods where they left it the same and the, the uh, business improved faster in the priced neighborhoods. Uh, people thought, oh, this will be hard, bad for business if we start jacking up. They only jacked it up when there were no spaces available. But the, uh, it, it, they looked at the sales tax revenue in the two areas, and the sales tax revenue went up faster in neighborhoods that began charging demand-based prices for curb parking. So that should um, answer the, the objection that this will be bad for business. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think we'll, last question, or maybe two more. One of the major drivers of increased congestion, cars and transportation, carbon and cost at a regional scale is distributed residential and commercial development. How do we manage risks of pricing and the elimination of minimums? So I think Aunt, maybe I'll get this to give this to Andrew because you've you've been dealing with this. How do we manage risks of pricing and the elimination of minimums? What neighborhoods does pricing and no minimums have no net negative impacts at regional scale? And where should we be more cautious? Yeah, thanks. So I'm just reflecting on that a bit here. And, and so I guess the, the risk piece on uh, pricing, and again, we eliminated minimums essentially, we've left it to the open market through our through our approach. Again, still relatively early days, so I, I don't have a lot um, of data. And, and COVID did, of course, change uh, the flow of traffic. A lot of people were working from home. So our downtown core wares and our university core, which were the two areas where we would typically see the highest level of, of paid parking, had significantly reduced traffic. So a little too early to provide anything too definitive yet. Um, but but I think the other so so what what we would often say uh, when when we were talking about this in those higher uh, density areas or those those main shopping districts is uh, what we found. Sorry, just something that's going on off on my other phone here or on my other device. It's messed with me there. Um, is is again I think the elimination of any type of parking requirements. Um, as long as the risk was that the businesses would fail. That, that was the biggest fear about this. People were saying, well, I'm not gonna go there to go uh, shop at that store anymore if you uh, remove parking requirements, uh, free parking requirements and you charge pricing. But again, I go back to that same point I, I talked about at the beginning is that this was championed by those same communities to say this allows us to use our spaces in a better way, to be more creative. And yes, it will mean that some people won't choose to go there if they have to pay a couple of bucks for parking. But what we find in the city is that most of those areas where people would say that already see a minority of their business uh, patron uh, customers essentially using car anyway. So White Avenue, which is the best known spot in Edmonton for, for that, uh, it's less than 40% of the traffic even comes by car in the first place. And that's going down more and more as we're building up those areas with greater density and mixed use development. So um, it's a risk for some of those people, but I, I don't think it's a, it's a risk for the businesses. At least they haven't felt that was the case. Thank you. And White Avenue is so walkable now. It's great. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to address one more thing. Uh, one question about managing parking at popular tourist destinations. If this wasn't someone from Whistler asking, um, contact me and I'll direct you to the RMOW person because Whistler has been trying to deal with, with uh, parking for visitors as well. Um, Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you because I know you have some, some final remarks, but I want to just thank our panelists. That was who knew? I mean, we all know that parking is such an interesting topic. It just gets people fired up. So thank you for your time and providing your input and your experiences. It was really fascinating and I learned lots of great ideas as well. Uh, so thank you for your time. Um,
good luck with budget, Andrew, and and enjoy the rest of your day, Courtney and Donald. So over to Alex. Hello, thank you so much. That was so, so interesting. And I've been studying parking for like four months now, and this is the <laughs> highlight. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you to everyone who came out. I just want to do a quick pitch for Climate Caucus for anyone who isn't a member yet. If you're looking for more great content like this, then and you want support and networking opportunities in the municipal climate space, please join us. You can do that by going to climatecaucus.ca and click the join us button. And then you can check out our calendar on Nudge for upcoming events like the next All Caucus call, which will be in January, and our next elected officials only call, which will be on December 17th. So please don't hesitate to send me an email with any questions or if you just want to chat and hang out. I would love to. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.